ways because the senior tutorial class is getting uh, started um, with uh, two speakers today, uh, both uh, anticipating graduation from St. Mary's College here in just a few weeks. And uh, one of the things that we do in the Department of Anthropology is however you fulfill the senior capstone requirement, we ask students to give an oral presentation that we open to the public. And it provides our majors with an opportunity to kind of bring it all together in one presentation um, on a topic that they've selected uh, that they're very interested in and kind of uh, demonstrate, you know, just um, what they've uh, learned about anthropology um, in terms of a particular topic that they've been studying, in this case, uh, over the course of the semester. So uh, thank you all for being here to support the students, and um, I'm sure we're going to have some very interesting presentations. Uh, I'm not sure whether it sounds to me like, at least for the first presenter, uh, questions are okay uh, during the presentation, so just um, speak right up. Uh, Dean Trisbula is going to be talking Not about trans name, right? transformative <laughs> fandom, uh, identity, self-image, and representation. So, would you go right ahead? So, yeah, um, questions are definitely encouraged because I know this is a topic that has a very uh, significant internal vocabulary that most of you will not be familiar with. Um, there are vocab sheets, but um, yeah. So my presentation is on um, fandom uh, and the way uh, people explore their identity and self-image growing up through with fandom and how that provides a form of representation. Um, so what is a fandom? Uh, it's a subculture that springs up around a source media, and that source media can be anything from movies, TV, books, to there was even just a photograph of a woman, uh, a police officer, and a bear that spawned a fandom. Um, and uh, people participating in fandom uh, produce their own media. It can be everything from fan fiction to video games to anything. Um, and something being a fan work versus a, um, uh, um, versus an original work is really only defined by modern copyright law. Um, an example of this is that Wicked is a fan work of Wizard of Oz, but it's considered an original work because Wizard of Oz is um, in public domain. Um, fan works are not less than original works. Um, they are, they can be fantastic. These are not photos, these are paintings by a lady named Hugh Clays. Um, uh, fandom started in the 1800s with the introduction of modern copyright law. Um, Sherlock Holmes was the first series to have fan fiction written of it that was considered fan fiction, um, which was followed in the 20s and 30s by the science fiction um, at radio and, t and, um, and fanzines, which were printed booklets that were distributed in fan communities. Um, and then later in the 50s and 60s, uh, Star Trek and Man from Uncle uh, started to have large fan followings. And the definitive thing about those fandoms was the introduction of Slash. Um, although it seems that we found some from the Sherlock Holmes fandom as well. <coughs> Um, and Slash is relationships between two male characters. Um, the thing about fandom that I wanted to study was the fact that mo many and most people in fandom are young. They're ages um, 13, which is mostly the age you're allowed to start using websites um, in terms of consenting to things. Um, Many of them have marginalized identities, be it race, ethnicity, uh, gender, sexuality. Um, they're creating their own text anonymously, so they're writing their own world, and there are large fan communities. Um, so they're basically a subculture, and that's how I looked at it. Um, People also interface with the source work. Obviously, the book they're writing fan fiction about is going to have an impact on them. Um, and the actors, writers, creators, the powers that be um, can have an impact on 
the fans, like this example is a fan who tweeted at Emma Watson, the actress who played Hermione Granger, um, saying that she wanted to become an engineer, but her father wouldn't let her. And what, what was she going to do? Because it was a men's profession, and what should she do about that? And Emma Watson just said, well, become an engineer. Um, I have a bias. I've been in fandom since I existed, essentially. <laughs> Um, I have a very positive impression of fandom, I have personal connections and experiences, and I have written quite a few fan works. Um, so I had to address that through my methodology. I started with a literature review and a reading of fandom meta, which is when uh, fans write about their own experiences and analyze the behaviors going on in their fandoms. Um, and what I found through the literature review was really that nobody's done this. There's been a little bit in um, sociology, psychology, and youth studies, and a little bit in media studies, but as far as I can tell, no anthropologist has done serious work on fandom. Um, so after that, I decided to do a survey with largely um, um, numbers-based um, and statistics rather than um, subjective answers, somewhat to combat the fact that I have such a bias. Um, so I got IRB approval for my survey. Um, I converted the survey into a web form and distributed it, um, and in fact advertised it online. Um, and then I read them, and read the responses, did the statistics, and interpreted it. Yay! Um, so, getting into the actual um, guts. These were the fandom metas that I read before I um, start, before I created the survey. Um, it, it's basically people um, talking about their own experiences and um, some of what they said guided the direction I went in. Um, people talked about representation in shows. Um, Korasami was a uh, relationship between two female characters at the end of a children's cartoon called Legend of Korra, and it was a big deal. Um, so there's actually a question in my survey specifically about that. Um, this was a literature academic, I don't know exactly what his credentials are, but um, talking about the way um, transformative fiction um, fan works interface with sort of cultural texts. Um, this is a uh, Captain Janeway cosplayer aboard the International Space Station, um, which I thought pretty well illustrated how deeply fandom can impact your lives. Um, so I uh, created the survey and distributed it via Tumblr and Facebook largely, and then the Organization for Transformative Works is a organization that provides um, representation and um, sort of legitimizes fan works and fan communities and also does some legal work. Um, and they were really excited and awesome and um, put it on their front page and <coughs> their Twitter feed. So that was cool. Um, I was expecting roughly 30 responses. I was hoping for, I was hoping I would get at least 20. Uh, within 24 hours I had 100. In the end, I had 375, and people wrote over 100,000 words in the free form answer sections. More than 99% of people made it all the way through the survey, and every single response was engaged and critical and thoughtful. So that was cool. Um, I'm just kind of going to buzz through most of this. Um, this was the demographics of the people who responded. Um, I asked about language. This one, um, I actually got a response. I, I had a question in there that was, you know, is there anything else you would like to say? And somebody pointed out that this question was very biased towards US perceptions of race and ethnicity, and that actually there's, you know, people who are white who are of a, a ethnicity that is not in power in other countries. So that was, um, and especially since I got a very international response, that was problematic, so this doesn't accurately represent that. Um, 
Like, do you have a disability? Are you the sex you were assigned at birth? Everybody knows what that means. Um, are you intersex? <coughs> um, this question I should have done better because <coughs> so many people said they were unsure. I guess I didn't phrase it very well. Um, um, this one surprised me. I didn't expect to have this many people who were aromantic or asexual say that they were. Um, so that was cool. Uh, this was if you are queer or LGBTQ, whatever. Um, I use the term bug guy. Um, is your current home situation? Um, and then this was has it always been in the past? Um, this, I took out Canada and the US because um, this was one of the ways I um, used to illustrate and analyze some of the freeform answers. Because I had so many in a short period of time, I didn't have a chance to really code everything. So um, a lot of this is just based on frequency. And this is an illustration of word frequency uh, by size of, of the words. Um, so it, you can see it was pretty international. Um, and this is, again, getting into the guts of it. Um, do you feel connected to the Mogai community? Another thing is I really shouldn't have used the term Mogai. Um, I used it because I didn't want to use LGBTQIA to be whatever, um, because it's hard to be inclusive of everyone in that community without having it be an alphabet soup. And I didn't want to use queer because it's a reclaimed slur and not everybody likes it. So I tried using Mogai, but not everybody in the survey liked it. Um, do you consume uh, slash fiction? Um, do you produce fan works? Um, do you produce fan works that involve slash or homosexual content or um, genderqueer content? Uh, do you cosplay? Do you crossplay? Um, and then this was people, I started asking people how they uh, related to their experiences in fandom, what their uh, um, impression was as to whether it had benefited them in certain ways. This was uh, just general, do you feel fandom has uh, benefited you? Um, have you felt like part of a community in any of your fandoms? Have you formed friendships in any of your fandoms? Um, do you feel that your participation in fandom has helped with your self-image and, and uh, self-esteem? Has, has it made you feel better about yourself? Um, do you feel that you have explored your uh, identity through reading or writing fan fiction? Um, the same for art and cosplay. Um, and then, do you feel that you have explored your identity through participation in fandom generally? And I. I think most of those show a pretty strong trend towards, yes, people feel that fandom has benefited them. Yes, people feel that they've explored their identity. The one thing that surprised me the most was um, cosplay. So few people said yes. Um, I expected that to be larger um, because if you're literally dressing up as another person, I thought that would be a way to explore yourself. But um, I realized actually that yeah. Um, just a question of just thinking about that. Did the question include is it just if you do or is it people saying no I don't cosplay? That's at what all? I realized is it might just be that fewer people cosplay than do the other things. So you should have had if maybe if, if you cosplay do you feel yeah. That that was a good point. So that would explain it. Yeah. Um and this was if you are a guy, um do you feel that um Participation in fan media has helped you feel better about that specific aspect of yourself. The, the if you're queer, if you're gay, bisexual, transgender, whatever, is has fandom helped you feel better about that? Um, has interacting with other people in fandom helped you feel better about that? Um, and then this was getting into representation. This was meant to be sort of a side question um, because I was just curious um, whether people thought. Um, queer um, people were adequately represented in the forms of original media they consumed. Um, obviously people did not think so. Um, but it ended up being that a lot of fan works seemed to be uh, people 
creating their own representation in somewhat in response to the vacuum of representation and original work. Um, so I had some free form answers where people could um, go on at length. They were just paragraphs with no. Um, yeah. So um, this was a question about Khorasami, which had just happened when I made the survey. Um, and people talked a lot about representation in it. Um, uh, this was a question about whether people felt comfortable and what their experiences were like cross-playing, which is when you're dressing up as a character who is opposite the gender you present as. Um, and people generally have positive impressions. Yeah. Can you tell us what Khorasami is, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, Khorasami, uh, as I said earlier, is um, from a children's show called Avatar Legend of Korra. Um, there were three characters who had a love triangle throughout large portions of the show. Uh, Korra and Asami were women, Mako was a dude. Um, and Korra and Asami both dated Mako. And the assumption <coughs> generally was that Korra and Mako would end, end up together in the end. Korra and Asami walked off into the sunset together, and the creators specifically said, they wanted them to kiss, but the network wouldn't let them. Um, and the fandom, and actually just fan communities everywhere, even if they weren't watching the show, kind of blew up about this because everybody was so excited that it was finally happening, that there was a, there was representation of a happy, healthy, queer couple on a children's TV show. Um, and, but there was also a big backlash because people were saying, no, we can't have gay people on a kids' show. That's you know that, that that has to only be in adult shows, you know, because queer people can't exist as far as children are concerned, or something. Um, so yeah, uh, I asked people how old they had been when they started participating. Um, the answers were, you know, right around the beginning of puberty, and actually some of the uh, youth studies and and life span studies I read um, pointed out that this is particularly, this age range represented here is very much the uh, range when uh, the most identity exploration is being done, when people are exploring the way they uh, relate to other people, uh, their own identities. <coughs> if there's something about them that is different than many people, it will become an issue and they will learn about it at this age. Um, Slightly older was the answer for how old were you when you became aware of Slash and um, queer work. Um, and then I got into queer baiting. And again, this was supposed to be a little bit of a, oh, I'm just curious about this, this wasn't the main trend, but um, queer baiting is when um, a show teases um, a, homosexual relationship possibility, uh, uh, there being a possibility of it happening to get queer viewers or people who just like that um, interested and to watch the show or whatever, um, but never intend to actually follow through on that, never intend to actually um, give representation. And I asked what people knew about it, and then the next one I asked what people felt about it. and. Um, <coughs> Sherlock and Supernatural are known to be pretty bad offenders of this. They both have um, two male characters who um, have a lot of, of relationship subtext, but the creators have flat out said, for Supernatural anyway, that they won't do it. Um, and people also talked about representation in this one, and then I asked about what they felt about it, and I think they felt that it had to do with representation. Um, it people weren't happy, um, and a lot of it was um, people talking about how it was hurtful. It was more hurtful than if there was ever than if there was no teasing or, or no subtext or anything because it made it a joke. Um, 
And then I asked people if they thought their ships would become canon, and a ship is when you think two characters should get together. Um, and Kurosabi was mentioned a lot, um, but as, as being an example of one that actually did come true. Um, but people weren't very hopeful. <laughs> Um, I asked people if they felt that their participation in fandom had had an impact on their um, understanding of marginalized identities. People thought yes. <laughs> um, and then I started getting into um, people's identities and people's um, relationship to the queer community generally. Um, and I asked what their romantic orientation was, and aromantic was bigger than I thought. I, I was expecting the panromantic and biromantic. I was not expecting the aromantic. And then Excuse I asked me. what, yeah. Uh, can you go back and tell us what panromantic and biromantic, what those terms mean? Um, panromantic means that you are, you have, you can have a romantic attraction to people of any gender. So that's not just men and women, that's uh, queer, non binary, age, gender, et cetera. Um, biromantic means men and women. Um, so people also do other things and still identify as biromantic and that's fine. Um, aromantic is you don't have romantic attraction to other people or at least you don't enjoy having romantic relationships. Um, and then I asked about people's sexuality and this was probably the biggest surprise in the whole thing was that asexuality was huge. Um, like half the people in the survey said they were asexual. Um, and I was not expecting that because fandom can be so sex obsessed and a lot of the fan fiction, a lot of the fan art is erotic um, and uh, is also, there's a lot of romance. So the aromantic was a surprise in the same way. Um, and then I asked about people's genders and Obviously, female was the runaway first, um, which I was expecting. There have been other studies previously that have shown most people in fandom are female. I did another slide so you can actually see the other genders. Um, age gender surprised me. I was expecting gender queer to be bigger, um, more represented, but age gender was um, almost as common as male. And what is cis? Cis is cisgender, which is you identify as, well, you are the gender that you were assigned at birth. So if you had typically female uh, primary and secondary sex characteristics and you feel that you are female, you are cisgender. If you are not, if you feel like you're male, but you have uh, typically female sex characteristics, then you are not cisgender. Um, I asked uh, for just any other impressions on fandom and life. Um, this was a free form answer. And people generally said it helped. And they had to do with people. And they had friends. And it was very positive, all of these answers. Um, and then I got some specific responses that I wanted to talk about. Um, I got a lot of these saying that they didn't know what asexuality was before they got into fandom and then they figured it out, and then they stopped feeling broken. Um, a lot. Like, I, I haven't um, coded them to figure out the number, but it must be like 50. Um, this was people talking about um, their experiences with mental illness or, neuro, or being neurotypical in fandom and how it had helped them and how they had related and worked through it with their characters. Um, this was the one that talked about the race question and the fact that it was uh, Eurocentric and inaccurate. So thank you, whoever you were. Um, and this one, I knew there was a large Russian population on LiveJournal um, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Um, but it was all in Russian, so I didn't know what was going on. Um, I just knew it was there. Um, and I got this response and I looked into it more um, and 
it really does appear that fandom has become a form of political dissent um, in Russia, and especially just like this week or something, uh, Vladimir Putin outlawed memes about him. Um, uh, I hope you know what a meme is. Um, and then there were some fun ones. Um, I liked this one. I don't know who said that one, but it was entirely off topic, but funny. Um, so interpretation. I got a lot of responses, and the depth of the data was very fortunate because the trends were all uh, shown very strongly, so I feel fairly confident in making my conclusions. Um, things I goofed, though, that have to be taken into consideration. I didn't format the age questions very well. They should have been multiple choice. They were free-form answered. Um, people didn't like the term Mogai. Um, I should have asked something about self-insert fanfiction, which is when you write a fanfiction with you or a character representing you, um, interacting with the characters in the original fiction. Uh, I didn't ask anything about the negative aspects of fandom or of, uh, about people's um, experiences with mental illness and the legal standing of fandom, because some authors are very authors and creators are very opposed to it, and some like actively make fan fiction. So, um, and it was a Eurocentric survey. Um, so my surprise is the Organization for Transformative Works being as helpful as they were was amazing and awesome. Um, I didn't expect the responses or the um, depth of the responses, um, and I've mostly talked about this. Um, so my conclusions are that fandom has helped well, you can read it, but um, fandom has helped many individuals explore and understand their identity, and I believe that it's pretty strongly shown through people saying that it has. Um, one thing to take into cons um, to consideration is the audience I reached, because this was only uh, distributed through Tumblr, um, Twitter, and Facebook, um, as well as being on the Organization for Transformative Works website, but. I only got like 20 responses from that source. Um, so the audience I reached is a very involved, enthusiastic audience in terms of fandom. So this is, um, these are conclusions that apply to that demographic, not necessarily everybody who casually participates. Um, but <coughs> this one was the, um, conclusion I did not expect, and why I talked about representation being a surprise several times, um, is that in terms of the Russian fandom, but also in terms of people creating their own stories, their own text, their own culture, their own cultural texts, um, it's a way to write into existence a world that doesn't exist now in terms of acceptance and, and understanding and education about, um, about race, about gender, about sexuality, um, about the fact you can be asexual and the fact you don't um, necessarily have to have sex to be human um, or not broken, um, about the fact there's things other than men and women um, that so those are things that are not represented in books and TV and movies or plays or anything, generally because they're considered too risque, but in fandom they're the center. They're almost every, I mean, a very, very large proportion of fan fiction is slash. Um, a very large proportion of fans um, consume slash and consume um, things where the characters' genders are flipped, or, or something like that. Um, so that that was, and they're forming their own representation, and that surprised me. I mean, I, yeah. Um, with people represent um, with asexuality being so heavily represented in this survey, I wanted to talk about this. Um, my theory is that while 
people who are asexual or, or aromantic do not pursue romantic or sexual relationships necessarily. They might, um, but they do have a fundamentally different experience of sex and romantic um, attraction. And I had assumed that the amount of sexual content and romantic content in fandom would have been an alienating factor, but they do still have an experience of it, and this might be a experience they're drawn to that actually is is their way of experiencing it. Um, and, 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 yeah. Um, so, the future. I really just brushed the surface on this. I mean, even the data I have, I need to code it, I need to do much more analysis. This is um, very top level and there's so, so much more out there to do um, and very little of it has been done in fandom. I, I mean, the fact that I ha had to hand out a vocab sheet and that I'm sure most of the people in this room don't know what any of it is. Um, but. I think it's important because it's becoming a larger and larger part of young people's lives. Um, so, woo, future research. Those are my sources. Um, questions? We don't have very much time. Okay. Maybe one or two questions. Um, Lisa? So, I have some friends who do fandom stuff in hockey. Uh -huh. I don't know if anybody remembers that show. Yes. And they abandoned it as soon as they introduced a gay character in the thing, and well, they okay. were actually very angry that the show had appropriated their world. Uh -huh. With it, which seems the opposite reaction. <coughs> That's to interesting. Yeah. That, 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 I don't know how that factors into yeah, what well, I found, but it was they were very hmm. not happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which seemed the opposite of what I would have thought. Yeah, that's surprising to me. That's interesting. Um, I also have some friends who are um, they're mostly into cosplay right mm -hmm. now, and I just think it might be an interesting thing for you to look into the future. Is um, there have been I guess a lot of issues coming up um, racially within cosplay oh, where they've yeah. been telling where especially it's very dominated by Caucasian people yeah. and that people who are, are black or Asian or or Indian are told like, well, you should only dress as a character that's black in this show or mm. is Indian in this show and not being allowed to have the diversity they want within <coughs> character development. So I that think, might be something to look at. Yeah, there's also been issues where people, have, um, white people have been cosplaying someone who is not white and been putting on blackface. Mm -hmm. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that is definitely a good point. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was just um, wondering if you wanted to look into the transition between like when the internet didn't exist uh -huh. into like this huge explosion of online communities and fan fiction and uh -huh. um, how that's changed with the advent of the internet because uh -huh. that, that had to be like a huge it, difference. Definitely, yeah. Yes. <laughs> that would be a good thing to look at. And that's one thing that has been looked at a little bit by I believe a sociologist um, and the Conclusions were that it was a, a very separate community who had, I mean, there, were, there was some transition of people, especially in the 80s and early 90s, of uh, especially men switching from, um, from written fanzines to internet uh, web lists and stuff, or email lists, um, I guess it wasn't even email them. But, um, the reason I didn't really look into it is because um, most of the people who participated in the old fandom aren't participating in any fandom anymore, so it's hard to find. Chris Coogan, um, I don't think Paul has to get things done, but 